And in order to deeply understand the beauty of sexuality, you also need to understand the destructive side of sexuality. So I enjoy uh, exploring dark and painful emotions and nothing makes me more frustrated than if people are trying to take me out of my depressions. There's a very famous story in Russia about a man kidnapping two teenage girls, keeping them for almost four years in a dungeon that he himself spent four years building. He raped the girls almost every day, and in the end, they managed to outsmart him and escape. When I heard this story first time from a friend, he told me that he knew one of these girls, and now 20 years later, she was ready to tell this story, and he believed that I would be the right one to help her write her story. Basically because I've been working with sexuality and taboos for so many years, I've been working with painful emotions. For me, like exploring sexuality has been a process trying to teach myself to contain my own sexuality and to see the beauty of it. But through this story and through many of the other books I have been writing about sexuality, I've been exploring you could say the beast in people or exploring the dark side of sexuality. And in order to deeply understand the beauty of sexuality, you also need to understand the destructive side of sexuality. So when I went to Russia and met this girl, I was curious to see how she and I would connect because if we didn't have any connection, I would never be able to write her story. But when we met, there was kind of like trust, instant trust, and a genuine loving and caring connection. And she felt very open with me. She didn't speak English. So we had to communicate through a Google Translate. I hired a, an interpreter, but it didn't work out very well because the conversations we needed to have were so intimate and painful that the interpreters I found could not handle it and they would start feeling embarrassed about the conversation. So we ended up using Google Translate and we ended up digging deeply into the taboo of rape. She, of course, knows everything about rape seen from the victim's point of view. And I know a lot about the sexual energy when it turns destructive or when it turns beautiful. In this case, it was a story about a rapist who could not contain his own sexuality and used it to destroy other people. And there are a lot of reasons why men commit rape. And for me, when writing this book, the process was less about writing the book and more about healing the victim. So I, I didn't really look at this process as a storyteller or a journalist. I looked at Katja, the main character, as a person that needed my attention, that needed my care and understanding. Because when she came out of this hell, it was impossible for anyone to understand what had happened to her. It was impossible for her to talk to her family even to talk to a therapist, because who would actually understand what happens if you're put into a little cage like six square meters, six meters underground, treated like an animal and raped on an almost daily basis. Her friend had two children under these conditions and they had no help. And they lived in a super primitive way and they survived. They still had hope. They still fantasized about escaping. Their families thought they were dead. So when you come out of this, how do you talk to other people about it? For her, this was naturally not very easy. And we ended up having these super honest conversations about pain, about suffering. And while doing that, 
we also created a loving connection and this connection was growing and I felt like writing this book was a kind of like doing good not only for her but also doing good for other women who have been raped or abused sexually or men as well. And I also decided to donate all the profits from the book to the victims. And while working on her story, it became more and more apparent that she never understood why this had happened to her. She never understood why a stranger would suddenly destroy her life, not only her life, but her family's life, and create so much damage. And she told me that she would very much like to understand what was going on in the mind of the rapist. But as he's in prison and uh, the media has not been able to contact him, a lot of journalists have tried, but he doesn't want to be in the media. He's in prison. He wants, of course, payment for interviews, but he can't receive payment. And uh, who wants to pay him? So. We talked a lot about the rapist. She said it would be interesting for her to understand him. And I think that would basically be interesting for anyone, because if you want to avoid rape, then you need to understand why someone would rape. If you don't understand the wild animals in the forest, you can't avoid them. You need to understand how they move, what motivates them, why they're doing what they're doing. I decided for her sake to write the story of the rapist. First, I wrote the story from her point of view, from she was a little child until now, being in the dungeon, getting out of the dungeon, escaping, and her healing process afterwards and her life today with her husband and children. And I said I would very much like to write the story from the point of view of the rapist for her sake. So she would get a chance to understand everything that had been going on inside him because one of the things she told me, one of the very important things was that she never suffered from the Stockholm Syndrome. She never felt any care or love or had any like positive feelings for the rapist. That might have happened because they were completely depending on him. If he would not feed them, if he would just leave them in the dungeon, they would die of thirst and hunger. So it would be natural when he came with food every day and even though he raped them, then it would be natural that some kind of attachment would come out of that. But that never happened, she said. And one of the reasons was that he never said anything about himself. They knew his name, they knew his age, and they knew he lived with his mother in a nearby house. What I did was I, I spent six months trying to find him trying to connect to the prison authorities. I tried through all kind of different channels, but I never got in touch with him. And in the end, I started talking to the police and I looked through all the evidence they found in his house. I looked at what they have found out during interrogation. And through this, I started writing the story of the rapist seen from his point of view. It was a very strange feeling because I basically had to put myself in his shoes and think and feel like him. And I realized that inside me as well, there's also a dream of owning women. I mean, I could sense that he was driven by extreme loneliness, opposite what a lot of people think about this story. He never wanted sex slaves. He wanted a wife. He wanted to escape loneliness and he chose to domesticate women underneath his garage in his garden. As I entered his mindset, of course, what I wrote was maybe, I would say, 50% fiction, 50% based on facts. But I knew it would probably be better to write the story myself than to do an interview with him, because every interview ever done with him he has been telling different stories. He's never been like consistent. And I believe he is a notorical liar. So stories like that, the exact truth will never come out. 
So I spent a lot of time studying the evidence, looking into interrogation and putting myself in his mind. And while doing so, I realized that inside me as well, that this, there's a dream of owning women. I'm a pleaser, so I would, I would never be turned on by the idea of doing anything against other people's will. But I can feel that probably there's a kind of universal connection between masculine and feminine, that for a man there's a strength in owning a woman and a strength of a woman taking care of the man in a certain way. Perhaps not man, woman, but masculine, feminine, I would prefer to say, because I think masculine and feminine can be in both men and women. And this story is basically telling the extreme, it's an extreme story of male ownership and female submission. And as I wrote the story of the rapist, I basically used myself and I was thinking, what would happen if I lost all kind of ethics and if I stopped caring about other people's lives? How would I think and how would I act? And in that process, I wrote his story based on a lot of guesswork, intuition and some knowledge. But the idea was not to tell the true story. The idea was to get into the mindset of a rapist, allowing the victim to see what could have been the truth and for her to heal up by understanding what kind of man did this to her and why he did it and what he was thinking, how he prepared and what kind of fears he had. And especially understanding that one of the things that motivated him and I think a lot of rapists is in actually a fear of women. I think most rapists are scared of women and they want to control women. They cannot interact with them. And in this case, the rapist built a dungeon under his garage. And in this dungeon, he imprisoned female energy, enabling him to control it fully. And that gave him a kick. I believe that that was his victory, that all the fear he had all of his life and all his terrible relationships, his bad relationship with his mother, had given him this extreme urge to control female power. It's a long story, more than 300 pages, but the most crazy thing happened at the end of this process. I was basically ready to finish the book. And then suddenly the victim, Katja, writes me and she tells me that there's a guy writing her on social media and he claims to know the rapist and it made her very scared. So she asked me what to do and I told her that she should tell him to contact me and I would find out what he wanted. He claimed to have been in prison with the rapist. So when he wrote me, he didn't speak English either. We were communicating through Google Translate. It turned out that it was the rapist writing from prison. Of course, I didn't believe that when he told me, but I asked him a lot of questions and it was clear that he knew everything about this crime from the inside. And as I begin, began to understand that this was the rapist, I started asking him a lot of questions, but he didn't want to do an interview because the reason why he had approached the victim was that he had a dream that when he comes out of prison, which he does in 2021, after only 17 years in prison, which is nothing when you think about what he did, when he comes out of prison, he wants to meet the victim live on television. And he believes that he can make a lot of money doing that and that she can do that as well. Of course, she is not interested in that. 
and she doesn't even know if she would ever be able to face this man again. But I spent four months writing with him, basically every day on social media. At that point, I managed to get into his mindset. He wouldn't tell me a lot. He told me about his dreams when coming out of prison. He told me about his dreams of women and what he wanted to achieve. He didn't want to be very specific, but I managed to get a clear sense of that man. I managed to get this conversation into the book as well. I think what for me makes this book very special is that it's not a book written by a storyteller or a journalist who wants to tell a sensational story. It's written by a person trying to help a victim to overcome her pain by writing her story, creating a space for understanding, making it possible for her to go to the next step of putting her painful past behind her.